We've been talking uh, uh, so far in the show a little bit about the Green Climate Fund and uh, about the importance of finance here. And of course, one of the big things that this money is going to be used for is adaptation, helping poor countries adapt to the worst consequences of climate change. I'm delighted to say that I've been joined by Rachel Berger from Practical Action and we're going to talk to her uh, briefly about the fund and then move on to see kind of where the status of the talks are when it comes to adaptation. So Rachel, first of all this fund, it seems to be a, a contentious issue here. Have, have you got a, 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 a kind of a brief insight as to where you think it is? Well it seems that there's quite a lot of agreement. There was um, a transitional committee set up to consider how the fund should be established. They've done a report and Although, of course, you can't have 192 countries happy with everything, I think the view is that there's enough they're happy with that they won't open up the discussions, provided they can agree some kind of process by which the outstanding concerns can be addressed over the coming year. Okay. So that's the first stage in establishing the fund. So it seems like that might go forward. And, and what about adaptation more broadly here at Talks? Obviously, it's a, it's a huge issue. This is about helping countries adapt to you know, the horrendous consequences of climate yes. change. What's, what's the process? What's happening here? Well, there are four strands of adaptation here um, where decisions are expected. Um, first of all, that there's uh, an adaptation framework that was agreed in Cancun under which there's an adaptation committee. Mm -hmm. And this committee will have oversight over all the things that are established under the... Um, climate change convention linking adaptation at the moment it's all been separate so the committee will um, be there to give an overview to assess whether support for adaptation is enough both technical support and financial and to give advice so that's one strand and and, and what's what's happening with the committee why is that a, why is that not just you know straightforward well, they've had to agree what the committee would do, okay. um, and then they've had to say who's going to be on the committee. <clears throat> and uh, observers, NGOs, have lobbied strongly that there should be it should be an expert committee, not just, not political. A lot of the support that's needed is sort of very specific, and that um, therefore governments should be in charge of nominating for the committee but they should nominate experts, not negotiators. Okay. So that's one thing. We're also asking for a civil society presence, that government should not just consider government staff, but they should look to academe or NGOs for experts for that, and that the work of the committee should be open to observers. Okay. So those are key issues. Um, it doesn't seem to be overly controversial, mm -hmm. but there's always uh, countries that pick on things so that, that, that's one thing. If we can get that through, um, that'll be important. So the committee would not receive proposals f for funding by the Green Climate Fund. There are one or two countries that think it should, but I think the ma majority of countries and NGOs do not think it should. That it shouldn't get bogged down in those highly political decisions. Okay. So that's one potential that's one strand, strand of, of adaptation. Uh, What's yes. number two? Uh, national adaptation plans. Okay. So again, under the adaptation framework agreed in Cancun, national adaptation plans are seen as key to helping countries adapt. But these should be country-driven, so they're not specified you produce a plan which has all these activities covered, but it's about what the plan ideally would contain and guidance on what it should contain. So for those countries with low capacity, they see, oh yes, we have to consider, we have to work with all our departments and we must not forget ecosystems and communities and all that kind of thing, and some guidelines. So that, um, when we saw the draft text yesterday, we thought it was pretty good. We had very few comments, but that's now being considered in more detail today. At the moment, it's, um, the guidelines are too long. Decisions okay. really need to be shorter, so that's the thing. Can they agree to shorten? Can they agree to leave things out? Okay. Um, so that's number two. Then the other thing is loss and damage. So the issue of loss and damage is when mitigation targets are too weak, mm -hmm. or even if they were strong, we've left it so long that there are going to be more and more climate-related disasters, both the kind that one hears about in the news, the ty typhoons, the hurricanes, the droughts, but also this steady change in climate that ultimately means that it could be extremely difficult for some countries to produce enough food, um, to protect their people from floods and so on. So there needs to be some kind of mechanism, uh, like an insurance mechanism or compensation, where people who, countries that are overwhelmed by climate-related 
disasters and problems can receive funding when adaptation is not going to be enough. Okay. And that's obviously quite contentious. <clears throat> the, then another strand is there's been a programme under the subsidiary body for scientific and technical advice which is about giving advice to governments on how to do adaptation, how to assess vulnerability to climate change, how to assess the impacts. And it's been quite effective. The main criticism being it is an advisory body and therefore it provides information. It does not implement adaptation programmes or projects. But that programme was a five-year programme. It's been widely agreed. It was agreed in June in the bond sessions that it would continue. Mm -hmm. But what exactly it will do and whether it'll, how long the programme will be has not been agreed. And that's what's to be agreed here. Okay, so these are kind of four strands of the talks yes. and adaptation. And what's the tone of uh, of this area of the talks been like? We've been we've heard we should expect fireworks when it comes to some of the other areas with regards to the Kyoto Protocol. And there's a lot of politics in these talks. Is adaptation the same, or is it a little bit easier? What's happening? Adaptation is less contentious, broadly speaking. The main contentious issue is that Saudi Arabia, one of the, as you can imagine, highly rich country will be affected if countries seriously tackle climate change because they will consume less oil. So in the original convention there were words like adapting to climate change and to um, the impacts of climate change or the impacts of response measures. Okay? So that means if countries do cut their oil consumption then something has to be done to help those countries adapt. And what has been strongly argued and was in the Bali Action Plan, which was agreed three years ago, was that response measures, which is, happens because of mitigation, mm -hmm. should be handed, handled under mitigation. Right. And the Saudis are refusing to agree that. So they're holding all the uh, ideas on adaptation hostage to the fact that they want to be supported or some kind of agreement mm -hmm. um, because of the impact of consuming less oil. Okay. which of course is outrageous and developed countries who are going to be funding putting money into the Green Climate Fund are no way going to fund support for Saudi Arabia. So the, that, that's one of the issues. The other risk, that, the, so that's the risk, that, but the tone of the discussions on adaptation are pretty amicable really. Okay. Yeah. And that sounds like a, a, a bizarre situation. You've got adaptation as highlighted as a big issue here and when, when people ask me what it is I always hammer home it's about helping those countries who are most impacted by climate yes. change adapt to the consequences yes. of climate change. But actually we've got Saudi Arabia who, who wants money to adapt to... Adapt to the impact of people mitigating against climate change. Okay. Yeah. Adapt to us using, using less petrol yes. and less oil. Yes. Oh, I mean, of course, there are countries that are also impacted. For example, like if there was a move or if um, due to taxes on travel and so on, then uh, air freighting food became expensive. Then you can see that countries that export fresh vegetables, for example, like Kenya, could also be impacted. And that would also come under the category of response measures. And it's widely re regarded that some support needs to be done, which is mainly about economic diversification out of climate sensitive sectors. Okay. And we've been talking about the use of finance at these talks and how important it is to have money to, to adapt to the impacts of climate change. What kinds of initiatives uh, are on the table? What, what are the kinds of things that might be supported with public or private money here? What kind of activities, you mean? Well, if you're talking about private money, then it will go to things that in some way are profitable. Uh, so things like investment in kind of um, green energy or green infrastructure, possibly, um, because that's part of adaptation for a de developing country. If oil becomes more expensive, then you need a low carbon development path. Uh, but really, for the kind of ways that practical action works, we're talking about helping people adapt to more challenging livelihoods, uh, more floods, more droughts, and therefore we're talking a lot about the agricultural sector, rainwater harvesting, also about access to energy, because if you've got modern energy services, then you can diversify your livelihoods, you can do small scale production, you can add value to what you produce and so on. 
And what are the what are the uh, methods for doing that? How do you how do you help somebody whose crops have been devastated by an extreme weather event? How do you how do you um, take action in the face of climate change? How do you help people adapt? What what kinds of well, there's several strands. The first of all, there you would do work on disaster risk reduction. So that means a whole variety of things, but early warning systems about events. So you may not be able to save crops in the field from a devastating storm, but you might be able to save livestock and some household possessions if you get even two hours warning. And then you need a safe place to go. So it's about storm shelters, early warning systems that are appropriate to the location. So it's no good if something goes out on the national TV, if down in the villages they don't have TV. Uh, so it's about sort of locally appropriate work. Weather, you know, weather information, which might be somebody cycling around with a megaphone in some places, or it might be a telephone tree, somebody phones somebody in, or somebody phones somebody else. So there are a variety of ways that reach people in villages, um, and so there's that aspect. Then there's um, about having more resilient livelihoods, livelihoods that aren't going to be so affected. So, for example, if you know, broadly speaking, you can tell when the season of um, flooding occurs, then you can help people develop cropping systems and crop varieties that mature before that season so that people harvest before then or you can help them have livelihoods that are resilient in the face of floods so in Bangladesh we've got people doing floating vegetable gardens mm -hmm. and um, moving away from keeping a few chickens, keeping a few ducks because ducks can swim and then in the pond on which the ducks swim, ponds that are created by the flooding, then you can rear fish in cages um, so that people aren't going into the highly dangerous currents of the river during the flood period. So there's a whole strand of things. And one of the key things is building people's adaptive capacity to understand that life in the future is going to be full of change. So you're not helping people adapt to a fixed change situation. You're saying life will always be different and uncertain. So helping people to be flexible in, in, um, having, in spreading the risks of how they live their lives. It's a fascinating insight not only into um, how people are adapting to climate change but also uh, you know the challenges that people are facing already. You're having yes. to change oh, yes. the change from chickens to ducks because they can swim is, is yes. a, the kind of thing that maybe you wouldn't think of naturally, but it's, it's fascinating. Yes, and you have to make sure that people can buy ducklings. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just about how they keep ducks. That will they be able to get access to ducklings? Of course, once you've got them in the community, then you can let the eggs hatch and mm -hmm. so on. So it's about building that, and that's also the same at national level. You've got to get people in government to think flexibly. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, recognising that whole sectors may need to change so that then um, what they support, the crops they support in agriculture may need to be different. So that means training in the agricultural universities may need to be different. So it's really about thinking very broadly. Okay. And I was talking to um, Salim Al Hook from IIED, who I know follows the adaptation strand of, of, of these talks very closely as well. And he was saying one of the things that had changed over the years at these conferences is that there's so many more fascinating examples of, of the kinds of work being done to adapt to climate change now. And I suppose at one end of the spectrum, that's, that's uh, very interesting and, and, and fascinating and, and, and uh, for people coming along is, is, is good. But it also illustrates the scale that uh, climate change is striking already and that yes. people are having to adapt now. Yes. Is that, are you seeing that as well, you know, more and more efforts at adaptation you know, rising up the agenda here as it becomes yes. more important? Yes, I think so. And I think, for example, in the Green Climate Fund, it is now um, widely recognised that adaptation you know, ought to be towards 50% of whatever money comes in, if they can agree on how to fill the fund with money. Um, half of that should be adaptation. What is really worrying and is certainly partly triggered by the finance crisis, but also by the fact that politically a lot of governments are towards the right and therefore very keen on private sector involvement, is the belief that private sector will fund adaptation. I think, you know, what profit is there in very poor communities? Mm -hmm. Yes, you need a local supply chain, you need a local seed merchant in the nearest town providing the right kind of seeds and maybe ducklings and, you know, that kind of thing. But that's not big business. That's, he's not going to invest in a big way. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about trying to persuade large corporations to invest. If you do that, you get large-scale technologies that are not pro-poor, but are pro-profit. Okay. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. It's been, it's been an incredible insight into, into these talks. Um, before I wrap up finally, I just want to ask one question, which is what would you like to come out at the end of next week? <laughs> What's your ideal? 
Well, a I, realistic ideal. Maybe. I think I'll try and be realistic. I would definitely like agreement on the adaptation strand things. A new a new stage in the Nairobi work programme, agreement to set up the Adaptation Committee, agreement of the National Adaptation Plans um, process and um, agreement on a more detailed programme on loss and damage. And then I would feel that at least one stage had been agreed, even though you can't do adaptation unless we have really strong action on mitigation. OK. Well, we'll talk about the, um, the role of mitigation now. We're going to go to an interview in a few minutes' time with the World Meteorological organization they've been uh, tracking the state of the climate uh, on an annual basis so we're going to get their latest update um, so Rachel thank you for joining us perhaps we'll talk to you later in the uh, week to see whether those outcomes you're hoping for have come together oh, pleasure. Um, yeah. and uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll keep our fingers crossed for yeah. you um, okay.